All right, let's pray as we get started. Jesus, uh, we, we're here. We're here at the park. We're here online. Even if we're here way later listening to this thing a few years from now, Lord, we're here. Here we are. Lord, we invite you to come and meet with us. Uh, we believe and trust that you're real and that you want to meet with us and that you can. So I, we invite you, I invite you to meet with us in this time, in this place, and to, to speak to our hearts. We pray that you would open up your scriptures and your word and that you would make them to come alive to us on a heart level. Pray that you'd engage our hearts and our minds to hear your words to us. And I pray that we would hear not only your words to us, but your heart to us. We desperately need to hear and sense your heart. So you're welcome here. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome. Welcome. So we're going to start out today uh, with a little bit of a closing the gap engagement here. So I do want you to respond by shouting out an answer. Is this clear? Yeah. And it's a little windy, so you will have to shout, right? We good? All right. So what are some things that tend to make you anxious? You can be as silly or as serious as you want. What are some things that tend to make you anxious? I'll, I'll start off. One is when my kids lovingly, wonderfully, annoyingly jump all on me at once and hang on my neck and choke me and cut off my air. And then uh, they talk to me all at once and this goes on for many minutes. That one makes me anxious. What about you? I'm sure that's not happened to anyone. Weather. Why, why, why does the weather make you anxious? Are you afraid of storms? Because I'm an insurance agent. That's right. You're an insurance agent uh, and weather makes a difference for your job. That makes sense. Okay. Cliffhangers on TVs and movies. You know, when they end something and it doesn't tell you what's happening. And then you gotta wait a whole nother season and or they never make a whole nother season. That's right. Cliffhangers, especially for shows that get canceled at the end of a season. So I, I got really into this show called Dark Matter. Anyone seen it? It, uh, it started out kind of cheesy and then it got really good. And then at the end of I think season three or four, it got canceled on this crazy cliffhanger. I didn't know it got canceled. That was pretty tough for me. It like is very dirty. Although if you're lucky, uh, some, some of these amazing shows like, uh, um, what are some of the ones that have come back? The ones I wanted to come back, like Firefly never came back, but they did give you the movie like five years later, which is unprecedented. Um, being on time. That makes me anxious. I, I'm right there with you. Packing makes you anxious. Anyone else? Rush hour traffic. Although in Manhattan, yeah, we do get some of that. How are we doing on wind noise? Are we getting a lot of wind noise here? Do I need to switch to this mic? I might try it. Let's see here. I'm gonna just be sitting here anyways. All right, let's see, how's that? If you switch me over to that one, do you get any wind noise? Wind noise, check number one. Is there any wind noise? Tech stuff makes me anxious. It can, it definitely can. Okay, uh, oh, I thought of another, uh, The Expanse. Anyone watch The Expanse? That show is sweet. Got canceled, but then it just got brought back by Amazon. Thank you, Jeff Bezos. Anyone else? What makes you anxious? You've already had one. A lot more than one thing makes you anxious, Hannah. I can't believe it. What? Uh huh. Holiday dinners, making sure everything's done at once. Like to make sure that the the turkey and the mashed potatoes and the green beans. Yes so that the green salad doesn't just melt into nothingness. I'm with you on that. I would have just, ha it, you would have, you had me already at like holiday gatherings, like family gatherings, that one can be anxiety producing anyways. Hey, we're not done. We're gonna like go with this for a little while. What else makes you anxious? Uh, one of the more serious ones for me is uh, not just a fear of failure, but it makes me anxious if I think I have or will fail and other people will see it and then not like me. So that one gets, that, that one gets me big time.
not getting the shoes you want from the internet at the right time because it might not be there. One, it was a one pass deal on that collaboration shoe. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah, getting that Deaver deal as we sometimes call them around here. Anyone else? What makes you anxious? When your kids get sick. Oh, yes. Yes, that is that can be very anxious. When there's puke all over you uh, or the other stuff. Yep. Let's go for one or two more. What makes you anxious? I know it's not just these folks. Money, yeah. Money makes you anxious. That's right. So uh, not having enough money or the fear of not having enough makes you anxious. And at least as, I'm, uh, as I've been told, having a lot of money tends to make you anxious because you wonder if it, when it's ever enough or how you should be handling it. Is it was it Rockefeller that says, being rich, uh, there is no pleasure in it? You're constantly worried about your money. All right. One or two more. Maybe one of you that don't typically say something. I appreciate it, Rachel. You don't always say stuff, and you threw out a few, so that's good. Who else? Dan, I know, like, you're probably anxious right now because I'm asking you, what makes you anxious? What, it, it, what is your answer? What is something that makes you anxious? Right now, in this moment. <laughs> All right, say that a little louder. Oh, yeah, okay, you tell someone you got, you're going to do something for them, and then you start running out of time. Not sure. Yeah, that is that can be anxiety-producing. All right. Uh, okay, so next question. And we talked about this a little bit last week. What is it like for you when you get anxious? Kind of describe that. When you're anxious, what is it like for you? Okay, you feel stressed, yep. Jittery? Yeah, for me it's like I've had too much coffee. And sometimes I'm not sure whether it's too much coffee or anxiety. Yeah. What else? Tightness in your shoulders, stiffness, yep. Uh-huh, go for it. Get short with people, oh yes. Uh, I, that never happens with me, does it, Jen? Put you on the spot. Yes, that is one of mine. What else? What's it like for you? Where do you feel it and how? You get hot and sweaty? Oh, not pretty sweaty. Yeah. Right, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> what is pretty sweaty? I love it. I love it. I lo yeah, what is pretty sweaty? It's not me. Yes? Okay, anyone else? What's it like for you? You cry when you're anxious. You just cry a lot. When you're anxious. Yes. Yes, that's right. Just a, There's a level of emotion and anxiety, and it's just you cry a lot. Yeah. Uh, it, that one isn't one that I, uh, it's not true for me until it gets very bad. And then I, I cry, and that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, and it's kind of weird for me. What else? We're going to hang on this. A few more answers. Huh? Clenched jaw. Yeah, Ben talked about that last week when we were talking about uh, Jesus wanting to lift the burden on our jaws like, a, like an animal plowing a field. He wants, we feel it in our jaws sometimes. That's right. Anyone else? Upset stomach. Clenched stomach. Yes. Yes, I get that one. I also feel it tightness in my chest. I feel like my heart, like I'm going to have a heart attack. I, it's, I've never had a heart attack, so chances are that's not what it's like. But losing appetite, yes. Yeah. Or overeating. I experience both of those. That's right. You hope they cancel out eventually. All right. Maybe one, one or two more. What's it like? What? You get sleepless. Oh, yeah. Yes, I can relate to that one. You get sleepless. Bite your nails, some sort of nervous affectation. Yes, I, I, ha I have a pen and I click it. over. I flip it and I click it. And uh, it drives Ben crazy. Okay? Anyone got one more they want to shout out? 
I'm surprised nobody said when uh, I get called on in the moment. Public speaking is the most common anxiety producer in people, even more than death. Fascinating, right? Public speaking. All right. So uh, for me, I, I have dealt with anxiety increasingly over the years. I didn't really know I was an anxious person until I became more of an adult. And uh, I probably, I've always been this way. I've always been kind of type A, control E guy, which uh, is awesome for Jen, I'm sure. But uh, at, as life has gone on and as stressors build and as, as big boy stuff happens, as more pain and, and, uh, and stress happens, I've found out that I, I actually do struggle with anxiety, especially the last 10 years or so. And uh, I also struggle with the things connected to anxiety. So like depression. Depression is the flip side of anxiety oftentimes. I can slip into that. After anxiety, I can slip into depression. Uh, insomnia. This is one that I never thought I would deal with. One of my f- uh, favorite bands is Copeland, this indie band. They're pretty sweet and awesome. One of their whole albums, Eat, Sleep, Repeat, was about his struggle with insomnia. And I just remember thinking, that sounds terrible. And now for the last two, three, three years, I've struggled with insomnia to the point where I, I have to take medicine most nights to get to sleep. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, I struggle with anxiety for sure. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's not a fun experience, right? Uh, I've also found that it's the things that I can't control that I get most anxious about. Does anyone relate to me on that one? It's totally illogical. The things that I can't control, I get anxious about. You would think it, it should be the things that I know I have some control over and need to perform for. No, no, it's the stuff that I can't control because I guess I've got control issues. And I think if I can control them, I can probably get it. But it's the things I can't control that I get most anxious about. So that's, it's the lack of control. Oh, yeah. Oh, it can, yeah. So there's something inside me that thinks I can make my life and my world work if I can just control it. God help me. So there's no denying that one of the strongest things, and I, I don't know, I was just thinking about this this morning. One of the strongest things that connects us these days in an era of such uncertainty, of division, I think one of the things that most connects us, black or white, Republican, Democrat, you list list it all out, men, women, rich, poor, you name it. One of the things that most connects us is our anxiety. We are very anxious these days. We are very anxious. And increasingly so. So the question we have to ask ourselves is what does God think about our anxiety? It's a really important question. What does God think about it? So if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn into it. If you don't have one, we've got a few. Uh, I did maybe the jerk move here, and I took one of our Bibles here as a stand for my notes. So if you're person number four and don't have a Bible, you can come get it, but you got to get me a stack of something to prop this thing up. So that's just that's the thing. So uh, don't feel bad. Get up. It takes one. Come grab some some of our freebie Bibles. Uh, we've also got the free Bibles on your phone. You can find the my favorite one is U version. Y O U version. A freebie has all of the translations for free. It's pretty great. Uh, but I would encourage you to also pick up a, a notepad and a pen. We're going to have you write stuff down at the end. You can use your uh, phone and your notepad on your phone if you want. I love Evernote on my phone, so that works pretty well for me. But Uh, I'm going to, yeah, ask you to have something to write with, and uh, a Bible would be great. So we're going to jump into Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. So Philippians is most of the way to the right. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. So God actually speaks a lot about anxiety and fear and worry in his scriptures. And we're going to focus on one that's maybe most famous. So Philippians 4, starting in verse 6. Does anyone want to read out just the first little command there that it starts out. Anyone got it? Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. That's it. Let's just stop there. That's Do not be anxious about anything. That's what God says. You're not supposed to be anxious about anything, right? So we're good, right? Right? We're good. You've heard what God said. He's commanded you not to be anxious. So I know you're good now, right? Anyone else good now? It solves it. We can go home. Next slide. Huh? Yeah, see you next time. We're good now. Thank you, Jesus, for telling me that I am not supposed to be anxious. Now, we got to sit with this for a little bit because that is where most of us stop. That's a very popular place to stop when we think about what God thinks about that. So uh, we're going to pause and reflect. This is not 
a shout out your answer question. If you do, it's great. It'll be sweet. But that's not really where we're going right now. How does that verse hit you? Especially as we stopped right there. The most popular command that we hear in Scripture. What does God think about our anxiety? Do not be anxious about anything. How does that hit you? What do you picture at God's face? What's his face like when he says that to you? What's the tone in his voice? Really what? Maybe his face is really bright. Yeah, it might. Yeah, okay. So maybe it makes you feel like you're not supposed to worry and that he's, he's got it. Mm-hmm. What else? What's his, uh, think about it. What is the look on his face and how does it make you feel inside? Do not be anxious about anything. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you feel a little upset because God seems like an old person sitting in a chair in heaven where nothing's wrong and he's not struggling with anxiety and maybe there's a disconnect and you get kind of frustrated. That My guess is that's a relatively common one too. And so you don't have to answer this one. But it's easy, I think, oftentimes for our default when we hear God to command us not to be anxious to feel something other than happiness. Some of us feel happy. Some of us feel a double whammy. Here's the double whammy I think a lot of us feel, especially for the Christian. They believe the scriptures. They trust God that what he says is true, and they're anxious, and they look at God's word, and they hear God say, do not be anxious about anything, and they picture him as frustrated with us. They picture God as mad at you because he's told you, you're not supposed to be anxious, and you're anxious, right? And so God's frustrated or angry or disappointed with us. You don't have to answer out loud, but maybe do some of you resonate with that one? Maybe that's not the answer you'd put on the, the, the Bible church test, but in your heart, in your mind, that's kind of the way you live. You know you're not supposed to be anxious because God said don't be anxious, and yet you're anxious. Don't be anxious about anything, but you are anxious about this thing and this thing and all these things, and it's a pandemic, and we're anxious about everything, and we can't even name all the things. It's just this fear, this anxiety we sit in, and so we shrink, and I think it's a pretty common response, especially for the Christian, to hear this command of God and to pull back. Do not be anxious about anything. I'm anxious, so I pull back. I hold back a little bit from God. I don't bring it to him. I don't tell him a lot about it. I feel kind of guilty about it, and so I pull back. I don't tell others a lot about it because it's shameful because I think I'm sinning by being anxious. Not only am I anxious, but I feel the double whammy of feeling guilty about being anxious because I'm not supposed to be anxious, and so there's a double whammy. Maybe you can relate to that. Mmm, that feels nice. So we pull back. And so we come to church on Sunday mornings, and we say, I'm fine. How are you? And we smile. But we are not fine. We're not fine. We're really anxious. We're not fine. So we're worried. We're depressed. We're anxious, and we're not fine. And there's a major disconnect between our lives and what we hear God telling us in that verse. There, there can be a major disconnect. So can you relate to that? And again, this is not an answer out loud one. How specifically can you relate to that? Do you feel guilty about being anxious or depressed? Do you feel like you can't really bring that to God or others? Do you feel like you need to put on a mask when you talk to other people? You need to put on a mask and smile and say, things are fine. How are you? So I want to ask you this morning, what if we've gotten God wrong on this? What if we've gotten God wrong? What if? What if rather than being frustrated 
and disappointed and mad at us in our anxiety? What if God is really kind to us? What if he looks at you with deep compassion and love and patience and longing? What if he wants to move in and to care for you right here in the midst of your anxiety? What if he wants to lift your burden? And what if that's what he's been trying to tell you all along? It's possible. So let's, let's pause here and pray again. Oh, Jesus. I, I mean, as I've, as I've shared with everyone, and as, Lord, as you know, I struggle with anxiety. And I know what it's like to struggle with the double whammy of feeling like I shouldn't be struggling with anxiety and feeling guilty about it. And feeling like maybe you're, you're disappointed in me because I'm not stronger. Lord, would you please show us your heart in the midst of our anxiety and our depression and our fear? Show us your heart. And I pray that today would be something useful to you to help us to move out of our fear, out of the burdens that we carry, and into a place of lightness. Oh, Lord, let it be true. In your name, amen. So we, are, we, we started this series last week. We didn't really make a big deal, like saying we're t- starting a new series. But we, we started a new series, at least uh, Ben and I internally, last week, focusing in on the burdens that we carry. We're calling this lifting burdens. And so it kind of has, uh, I like words and language, so it kind of has a double meaning. We're looking at the burdens that we're all lifting, that we're all trying to carry these days. And we're also looking at how God is so much kinder than we think and that he's trying to come in and lift our burdens and carry them for us. So that's where we're going this morning. Uh, So before we uh, dig in a little bit deeper to this Philippians 4 passage, I think it's going to be important for us to briefly define our terms so that we can understand what God's saying to us. So what is anxiety? We already described it a lot. What is anxiety? Well, at root, anxiety, at at the core... Anxiety is a physiological response to stress, specifically a physiological response in response, in response, a physiological response to a threat, specifically an imminent threat against our life or our well-being or our loved ones' lives or well-being. Our uh, anxiety is a physiological response to a threat, and it's actually not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. It's actually a very good thing. So, uh, anxiety helps us to respond well when we turn that corner, when we're out jogging, which I've done eight times in my life or less. When we're out jogging and you turn the corner and you see the beware of dog sign and you hear the bark, it's low. I I don't know. Woof. (laughs) That was almost creepier than it was scary. Woof. (laughs) You hear the bark. And you feel anxiety. And then in less than a second, a Doberman pincher jumps over that fence that is far too short. And it begins chasing you. Anxiety gets you ready to run. Anxiety protects you. And it's a good thing. So what anxiety does is it, uh, it, it, it brings your, te- your chest tightens up. Your uh, muscles tense up. Your uh, blood pressure pumps up a bit. And you get tense, your focus hones in on threats, your ears, your eyes, you are focused in on the threat. Gone are the thoughts of your Facebook post, or that thing that happened with your family, or what's going on in that cloud that looks like a bunny. Everything is focused in, and you are ready to run, and that is a really good thing when the Doberman's after you, right? So anxiety, and it, it, at root, is a physiological response to threats, and it's a, it's a good thing. And you might even say, God gave it to you. It's God's gift to you. It's kindness to you, because you are living in a world that you were not made for. Is that a surprise to anybody? You are living in a world you were not made for. You're living in a world of real threats. And God has given you a way 
to deal with it, to respond and to protect yourself. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a very kind thing. Very normal human thing. Did you know Jesus experienced anxiety? Did you know that? Oh yeah, that's where we're going. He knew that. Jesus experienced anxiety. Now now let's if this is true, it would be pretty important, right? And it might be kind of like the death blow to the idea that experiencing the physiological uh, um, experience of anxiety is a sin. So in Matthew, what is it, Matthew 26, and the same story told in Luke 22, you get some extra details in both telling the same story. Matthew uh, 26 and Luke 22, you see Jesus, he's about to go to the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is stressed out. He knows that right around the corner, there is a very real threat against his life, and he knows it's going to get him. He knows it's going to get him, and he is anxious about it. The scripture is pretty clear. It talks about him being in agony, in, uh, in great worry. Uh, what else does it say? He is troubled and greatly distressed, even to the point of death, so much so that his blood pressure skyrockets and the capillaries in his skin begin to burst with the pressure and his blood and sweat mingle as it pours out. This is a rare but known medical condition called, uh, what is it called? Hemo, hemo, oh, now I have to look it up. Hemodo, hematohydrosis, hematohydrosis, hemo blood, hydrosis, water. When you're really stressed out and your blood pressure skyrockets. Yeah. Jesus was very, very anxious about what was coming. So did Jesus sin? Well, you're going to be hard-pressed to say yes. The Bible's pretty clear. Jesus was sinless. Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 15. Anyone know that one? It's all right if you don't, but if you do, yell it out. This is your time to get an extra gold star. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, speaking, uh, verse 15, speaking about Jesus. Um, it says that, we, For we do not have a high priest... In Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, and yet one who has suffered and been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. Without sin. That's right. And so Jesus experienced the physical response of anxiety, but he knew what to do with it. The same passages say that Jesus brought it to his father in prayer. He told his father what he was experiencing, and then he said, Yet not my will, but your will. He says, if there's any way, God, my Father, can you let this cup of suffering pass away from me? I would love that. But if there's no way, your way is what I'll choose. That's crazy. He knew what to do with it. So perhaps it's not so much experiencing the physiological um, response of anxiety That is what God commands us not to do. But it's what to do with it. Let's take a look back at at Philippians 4, verse 6, and read a little bit farther. Now that we've gotten a little bit more background knowledge here. Everyone got uh, Philippians 4, verse 6? I want you to have it in front of you if you don't. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Yeah, God does not want us to be anxious about anything. And so he's given us a way not to live in it. He says, so, in everything, by prayer and supplication. Anyone know what supplication is? That is a high school English word, right, Crystal? Middle, well, but you would know, right? This is like, this is a little bit higher level. Supplication. Sounds weird. To supplicate. Thank you. We can move on now. Supplication means asking. Some of your translations will say, with prayer and petition, bringing a request. So God, in his infinite wisdom, says, don't be anxious. So when you are, because you are, otherwise, what is he talking about? He says, don't be anxious. So when you are in everything, through prayer, with asking, supplication, with, what's the next one? Anyone got the scriptures or know it? There's one often overlooked part. Thanksgiving. This is a part that is often overlooked, but it is a key component. You will get to 55% without Thanksgiving and get the F. That may be a 
anxiety-producing illustration for some of you. When prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which blows away all of our ability to understand it, will guard your hearts and your minds. You need both of them to be guarded. Your hearts and your minds will be guarded in Christ Jesus. So when you experience anxiety, what are you supposed to do with it? Well, it's exactly what Jesus did in the garden. You bring it to God in prayer. Tell him about it. Ask him to do something for you. And tell God what you're thankful for. Force your mind to practice thanksgiving. So do you see the kindness of God here? Maybe it wasn't the angry, disappointed God that if you had just stopped at the very beginning, you would have pictured God being. No. What's the tone in God's voice now when you hear him speak these things to you? He wants to come in and to take away the burden of your anxiety. He wants to come in and wrap his arms around you and protect you. So Dobermans, from what I hear, I've never had one. Dobermans are actually extremely gentle, kind animals to those who are their own. Right? If you own a Doberman, that is the most gentle, kind, loving dog to your family. But he is not kind and loving and gentle when someone comes and threatens his family. And did you know that God wants to be like that Doberman for you? So many of us just think he's the Doberman that's threatening us. No, he's the Doberman that counts you as his own. And he wants to walk around you like a junkyard dog protecting, protecting you from threats. God is kind with you. God wants to be like that for you in your anxiety. And here might be the key for you this morning. He wants to be like that for you even when you don't do it right. Even when you are anxious and you stay there for a while. Even when you fill in the blank. Even when you decide to spiral in on yourself like a dying star and live in your anxiety. Even when you spiral into depression. Even when you give in, you give up and give in, and you move back into your addictions. Your alcohol, your drugs, your pornography, your whatever. Even in those moments, God wants to be kind to you, and he wants to lift your burdens. Maybe that's exactly what you need to hear this morning. Even when you don't do it perfectly, he wants to lift away your burdens. He's very kind to you. Because Jesus did it perfectly so we don't have to. That's kind of the, you could, you could make that the summary statement maybe of the whole Bible, especially the New Testament. Jesus did it perfectly for you so you don't have to. He took on the burden of your anxiety perfectly for you so you don't have to. He took on the burden of your fear and your stress and your sin. And he carried it for you perfectly so you don't have to. Amen? I grew up Southern Baptist. That one works pretty well, my Southern Baptist upbringing. Let's try it one more time. Amen? Amen. That is an amen. He took it for you and did it for you so you don't have to. So every moment of anxiety, big or small, is an opportunity to let God lift your burdens and to move into his kindness. So we're in this pandemic season. Is anyone unaware Has anyone tired of hearing, we're in this pandemic season? What pandemic? Yeah, you're lying. You're lying. Yeah, we're in a pandemic season. And so the threat of disease and virus, I mean, we might differ on what we think, uh, the level and the specificity is of that stress, but there is a real virus happening, right? There's something real happening, and there's some crazy stuff happening in our society. So there are some very real threats to our lives. It's not abnormal to be afraid to get this virus. It's not also uh, 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 abnormal to be afraid of how that might affect your family. So that's normal. That's right. But this thing gets a little bit murkier, right? Maybe here's where you can relate. I definitely can. If this thing gets murkier because long before the pandemic season started, our stress responses, our anxiety responses kind of have gotten off. And we tend to be uh, turned up to 11 all the time. This threat response thing is on all the time. We're anxious all the time. And so we respond to threats even when we're not really there. And so we, our, our cardiovascular system gets ready. It gets pumping. We stress out. We get in when really, rather than a Doberman, 
we're experiencing not as many likes on our Facebook post as we had hoped. I mean, we laugh, but that's real, right? It's not a, maybe it's not a real valid threat. We, we get all ready to run for our lives when in actuality we're afraid, are we going to be pay, able to pay our mortgage? Not this month, although that may be true for some. But we're t- thinking about six months from now, a year from now. The threat is not imminent. So our anxiety sensors have kind of gone haywire a little bit and we're turned up to 11 all the time. And so we struggle with anxiety. But whether you struggle with legitimate anxiety because of legitimate threats or maybe illegitimate anxiety because of illegitimate threats, the path forward is the same. path forward is the same. So let's see here. I, I want you to hear the kind words of your... Heavenly Father, I'm going to read these over you. So if you want, you can turn in your Bibles, Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, and then we're going to jump down to Matthew 11. But in the book of Matthew, in the midst of your anxiety, whether legitimate or not, whether you have dealt with it well or not, I want you to hear the kind words of Jesus as he was speaking to a crowd of people that were anxious, like you and like me. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus tells the people, Therefore I tell you, and maybe you need to close your eyes and picture Jesus as best you can, saying these words to you. He says, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Isn't life more than food? The body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Anyone see any? Actually, don't see any right now. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow crops nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You are. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. Look at the wildflowers. Look at how they grow. They don't spin or toil. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and then tomorrow it's thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Not you of little faith, but O you of little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For the Gentiles, in this context, that's the people who don't know God. The Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And then in in chapter 11, Matthew 11, starting verse 28, some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Jesus looks out at the crowd who are anxious and weary. And he says, he throws his his arms open wide. Maybe picture him doing this to you. He throws his arms open wide and he says, come to me. Come, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. I know you are. Come to me and I will give you rest for your very souls. Take my yoke upon you. We talked about this last week. It's a farming analogy. Two oxen yoked up together to plow a field. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and your burden is light. my burden is light. Do you hear Jesus' kindness to you? Are you getting the picture? Jesus is very kind, and he wants to lift off your burdens. And so as we end, how do we do this? you got to ask this, right? We have to ask, how do we do this? How do we do this? So the first one, this one's going to be just a little simple trick. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you need to write this one down. We need to learn to calm our bodies so that we can calm our minds. Sometimes our bodies need to get calmed down first. And so a simple way to calm our bodies is the breathing square. Anyone heard of the breathing square? We're going to get to what the scripture says about how to calm our minds after this. But the breathing square, it's something that's just, it's very practical. Square has four sides. So you breathe in for four seconds. 
Hold it for four seconds. Breathe out for four seconds. Hold it for four seconds. And then you repeat it at least four times. Um, I remember um, a guy who used to be in our church who uh, had a lot of, uh, a lot of ex- elite military training said that this is one of the ways that they taught them to hold up if they're captured and being tortured. This is one of the ways that my counselor through the years has taught me to calm down so that your mind can slow down and engage. Do the breathing box. And so we're going to practice it right now. It's pretty easy. So get in a space. So let's breathe in for four seconds. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Hold it for four, three, four. Just breathe out. Two, three, four. And hold it. Two, three, four. Pretty simple, but pretty powerful. The next one is what our, our, that, that might enable you to do. So we need to calm our bodies sometimes so that we can allow our minds to calm. And so we need to just lean into Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. God has already told you. You might want to memorize this. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer. So we need to practice bringing our anxieties to God in prayer. Tell him exactly what you're anxious about and as best you can why. Maybe you don't know why. That's fine. Tell him exactly what you're feeling and why. Bring it to God. And then number two, ask him through prayer and petition, supplication, asking. Ask God to do something for you. Could be as simple as, God, please help. Or God, please take away my anxiety. Maybe God, help me to trust you more in this. Number, number four, who knows? Maybe there's a specific situation that you're anxious about that you want God to intervene in. Ask him for something. And then with thanksgiving, that's the last part. Practice thanksgiving. Think of three things as closely connected to your anxiety as you can that you can be actually, honestly, genuinely thankful for. Because uh, even as secular research is teaching us, practicing Thanksgiving changes the way our brains work. It actually and statistically increases your overall experience of happiness and decreases your anxiety. God must have known this. Because Okay, I, I grew up watching Star Trek The Next Generation. Anybody? Thank you. I know I can at least, okay, two of you guys. Star Wars, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. So this was Captain Picard on the Enterprise. This one, uh, so anyone heard of the Borg? The Borg are these like half robot, half like human or alien people that come in. They try to, they try to you know, con- convert everyone. They turn them into Borg. And so they famously said, resistance is futile. Thank you, Greaves. Resistance is futile. And that applies here. They're right. Resistance is futile. It's not enough to just pull up your worry weeds. It's not enough to just ax down your anxieties. Because just like weeds, if you don't replace them with something new, if you don't plant something new there, what's going to grow up again pretty quick? The worry weeds. That's right. And so God knew this too. We need to replace our thoughts that tend towards anxiety with things that are good. If you keep reading, the next few verses talk about whatever is good and noble and true and all these things that are true and good. Instead, think about these things. Thanksgiving and gratitude gets you in a different mode of thinking. And this isn't just mere positivity. I'm going to call it holy realism. It's real things, the things that are really true, the reality of Christ. And so the next time that you experience the physical sensation of anxiety, whether legitimate or not, practice these things. Stop and bring it to God in prayer. Tell him what you think is going on. As best as you can tell why. And then number two, what are you supposed to do? Ask God for something. Ask him. And then number three, practice thanksgiving. Thank, be thankful in the midst of your prayers. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we're going to, let me, let me just end with this. So we're in this unprecedented season of uncertainty, right? There's so many things that are outside our control. We we keep saying this, but it's still true. So much is outside our control. Whether it's the virus thing, whether it's what's going on with our kids in school, whether it's our jobs and uncertainty about money, we are in the midst of so much that is outside of our control. So much 
outside our control. And so we are anxious, right? We are anxious. But more than ever, we need to listen to our anxiety and to what Jesus says. More than ever, we, this world needs people who know how to handle their anxiety with God. Know how to bring it to God and let him lift our burdens. Because you know what uh, might shine the brightest these days? In the midst of a, a culture and a world that is anxious and, unaf- and afraid and in un- all the uncertainty. It would be people that know how to deal with their anxiety and to bring it to God and live unanxious lives. That might really shine. And your, your neighbors, your co-workers need someone who has what you have or has what you could have. And so I, would, I think that more than ever, uh, tall grassians need to practice some self-leadership in this area. And there's a lot of things connected with this that uh, we could talk about, uh, and, uh, but we're not going to talk about today. We could talk about, um, how, about uh, counseling and, uh, and letting others in and the role that medication can play and all these other things. But what is needed most to start is self-leadership here to begin practicing on an individual level what God has already taught us, how to bring our anxieties to him in prayer and to let him lift our burdens. And then these other things can come. And who knows what platform God might give you as you practice living an unanxious life with your neighbors. Who knows what God might do? Oh, I think it's so needed. I think that might be one of the most needed things today. All right. So um, we're going to end. I'm going to I'm going to plink on the guitar here a little bit, and then we'll end with a few songs. But I want you to get out your notebook paper or your phone, your Evernote, your Apple Notes app or something like that. I want you to actually take three or four minutes, and we're going to practice this. Okay? So we're going to practice this. Number one, you're going to write down something that you're anxious about or maybe one or two things you're most anxious about right now. No one's going to look at your paper. Husbands, wives, I would encourage you not to look at each other's paper. What are you anxious about? And then number two, you're going to write down, what's, what do you need to ask God for in the midst of it? Write down your prayer. And then number three, write down three things that you're thankful for, as, as close as you can, connected with the things you're anxious about. Does that make sense? It, and it may be for some of you that the thing that you most need to start with is realizing that you need to submit your life to Christ. It may be that that's the source of your greatest anxiety. That'll be the thing that'll keep you from moving forward. Hear the kind words of your God, your maker, and come to him. All you who weary, all you who are trying to make life work on your own, apart from him, and let him come give you rest because of what he's done for you on the cross. Maybe that's what you need to talk to him about. So, um, yeah, and then we'll end with a little singing here. All right. So take a few minutes. Take another minute or two.
Keep writing if you need as we sing. Remember the lyrics, you can find them on our website, tallgrass.church. Scroll to the bottom of our event in the park and the lyrics are in there. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one who guides my heart Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you are. Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you, when temptation comes my way. Not stand or fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand or fall on you, cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Cause Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, you're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Oh, God, how I need you. You. Oh yes, oh God, how I need you. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise. And to know that saith the Lord And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him him more and oh 
how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his plan. Simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing, cleansing blood. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him or handled. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. And yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus' simply taking life and rest And joy and peace Last verse And I'm so glad I learned to trust Precious Jesus, save your friend, and I know that thou art with me and will be with me to the end. And sing the chorus again, sing it in hope. And in Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him how i've proved you are and oh, jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him all, all right will you pray with me one last time Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, my Savior and our God, we are anxious people. And sometimes we're anxious about being anxious and we feel guilty. Jesus, thank you that your word teaches us that you actually are very kind to us in the midst of our fear and our anxiety and that you want to lift our burdens. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you perfectly dealt with anxious situations in your life, not to mention sin, and did it perfectly for us so that we don't have to. Jesus, please lift our burdens. I pray that there would be those today that this is a pivotal day, a pivotal morning, perhaps, that they would learn something about what you invite us into, about how to deal with the physical response of our anxiety and how to bring it to you. Lord, I pray that we would see a difference in our lives and that, that peace that passes understanding, that you really would give it to us and that as we bring things to you, that as we activate our will, that you would step right in. As we take a step, that you would step in and that you would take it the rest of the way. Lord, we want your peace and we want to shine brightly in a land that's anxious and afraid. And in the midst of uncertainty, we want to be used by you to show folks the only place where peace and anxiety are found. Lord, please use us for that too. Thank you for your kindness and for lifting our burdens. I pray the same for our children as they live in a world where things are not right and they pick up our, on our anxiety and on our fears. We pray that, that you would meet them and that you would teach them, even as uh, parents try as well, that we would... Um, show them to your word and that you would teach them how to bring their anxieties to you. Lord, raise up a whole new generation, young and old, who know how to bring their anxieties to you and live unhurried, unafraid, peaceful lives, even in the midst of triggers of our anxiety. In your name we pray. Amen. This teaching was recorded at Tallgrass Community Church. Because God first loved us, we exist to love God and love our neighbors. For more resources like this, visit tallgrass.church.